today is the, uh, the last day of this conference. Um, as always, uh, throughout those three days, we are uh, kind of blessed with uh, unusually nice weather here in Stuttgart, which is uh, nice on the one end. On the other hand, it's, uh, it's all making the room a bit warmer than it should be, and some uh, rather come in a bit later as they enjoy the time outside. So with this, uh, I would like also to welcome you uh, warmly this morning from my side, Kido Baltus, and uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm very glad, happy and proud to uh, announce our first keynote speaker, Jeff Burton, uh, who is, uh, well, in the digital industry for about 40 years, um, and uh, he's a co-founder of Electronic Arts, the first game publisher, and uh, with that, he's kind of one of those guys that were part of the the very early days of the computer revolution, if that is uh, uh, a right way to say it. And the interesting, um, or one of the very interesting statements that I got when we met first at the occasion of a dinner in Berkeley, was he said, well, for a, lot, for a longer time, I was not really involved in uh, you know, uh, the computer and gaming industry, but now with virtual reality, augmented reality, this is a whole new thing, and, and this is really like catching me. And since then, he's also Again, a VC investor, Holodeck VR is one of the things you do. Uh, it's, if, if you just, you know, if you just listen to him, uh, the experiences and, you know, the different, uh, you know, waypoints in his life, that's, uh, uh, you know, a talk in itself. So I'm very glad you're here. Thanks very much for joining. Please, Jeff, come up. Your stage. Please welcome Jeff Burton. Good morning. Uh, is is this mic working? I guess, um, but I can speak loud enough for the for all the people that are here. I think anyway. Um, I'm very pleased. Thank you, you know, and Mark for inviting me because it's it's been it's been a great uh, two days so far, and today will be a great one too. I think. This I don't know how many of you are familiar with the skyline of uh, San Francisco, but it has changed in the last year or so uh, dramatically with the addition of the Salesforce Tower. Um, Changed the skyline, but it hasn't changed the city that much. It's uh, still a vibrant place, and um, what I want to try to do is hit some highlights this morning of what what the mindset in Silicon Valley is is like, or at least my perspective on it. Because I have been there. I started at Stanford when I was 18, so that's been 50 years I've lived in that area, and um, so 40 years of them have been in the the uh, high tech industry. And uh, I want to go kind of step back and get, maybe tell you some stuff that you haven't, that you that may not be aware of. Because there is, Silicon Valley people always ask me, you know, how does it get started? Um, <clears throat> and I actually, when I found out this stuff, I was kind of surprised too. There's, there is a legacy, 100, 100 or more years of innovation in Silicon Valley. Go back to 1887, the first mountaintop observatory in the world was in San Jose. That's the Lick Observatory. First vacuum tube was 1906. Um, it was um, uh, invented at Stanford. Uh, the first radio station in the U.S. was in San Jose. Um, by 1917, Magnavox had, in, had invented the moving coil loudspeaker, and it's still in use. That's what we use for, for speakers still is Magnavox's invention. They, they started out in Napa, but they quickly moved to San Mateo, which is uh, just near the airport. Um, and um, uh, they were, that, that's, a, that's a major innovation. The first television broadcast was in San Francisco, in the United States, anyway. Um, I don't know if there was one in Europe before 1927. But that's, this is the, this is the uh, Mount, Mount Sutro Tower in San Francisco. It still symbolizes the... The, uh, the idea of broadcasting uh, both radio and television. By, and that was 1927. So by a decade later, 1939, Hewlett-Packard uh, created the first um, audio oscillator. I presume it oscillates audio. I don't know exactly what it does. But um, it was a, what was kind of interesting about that was that it caught the attention of uh, Disney. So his high-tech company... Um, on the campus of the, the, the Stanford Industrial Park uh, of Stanford, um, caught uh, Disney's attention. They were one of the first consumer products companies to kind of get 
get take some advantage of the high technology that was being developed in the area, and that was in the in 1939. Of course, the <laughs> first atomic bomb. I give credit to UC Berkeley <laughs> for, for the you know at one and the same time saving the world and also giving us our means to destroy ourselves. Um, but anyway, that, that the LB, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab was really had a lot to do with that. In the 56, of course, William Shockley, who was a Nobel Prize winter, winner for this, he um, uh, founded his own transistor corporation. That's, that's really what started uh, uh, in a large way, the, the, the move into computers. And that was in Mountain View. So um, again, it's on the peninsula, um, all part of the Bay Area. Um, Let's back up to, because, you know, 160 years ago or 130 years ago, what is this? 150? Yeah, that's right. That's right. This is the 50, 150th anniversary for the formation of UC Berkeley by the state of California. And its objective was to provide instruction and thorough and complete education in all departments. That's great. They've moved on. They, they also have uh, provided parking spaces for their Nobel Prize winner uh, professors. It turns out that's more valuable than a Nobel Prize. If you've ever tried to find a parking place in Berkeley, you, you know that there aren't any. So to have your own on the campus of Berkeley, which is very small but has a beautiful view, that's great. But it's a huge university. And undoubtedly, UC Berkeley is the best um, public university in the world. Um, it's, it's just a, a fantastically creative place. That's in the East Bay. Um, and then we have Stanford which is um, on the peninsula, um, has an industrial park. Um, it's really spread out. It has been there, uh, it was 20 years after uh, UC Berkeley was started, Stanford um, was established. And one of the distinctive things that I've found, uh, because I don't know of any other university in the world that has this as an objective, it's, it's to qualify its students for personal success and um, and what? Direct usefulness in life. <laughs> okay, so that's an objective that has made a huge difference, I think, in the way people think. In it's added to the, the mindset of people in um, Silicon Valley, and um, and as I say, that there's no other university I know of in the world that has that as an objective, and has followed through for the last 125 years. Um, with that as its main uh, goal uh, on all different levels. It's focused on the, the personal success of its students. Um, and in a large way, I mean, these, these guys made a big difference. Uh, Fred, um, Frederick Terman was the dean of the engineering department um, at Stanford after World War II. He, um, um, he was also, well, he was, he was part of it before World War II also, but but um, uh, he was, a, a, both, both David Packard and Bill Hewlett were students of Frederick Terman, so they were influenced by him. And one of the things he did, which um, I'm not aware of any other university, uh, uh, anybody else in any university who's done this before or since, and that is he, he virtually um, made it a, a requirement for gaining tenure in, um, in the in the Department of uh, Engineering at Stanford, um, you, it wasn't publish or perish, it was go start a company, and then you can come back and, be, and get tenure. So the faculty at, at, in the engineering department at Stanford all basically were required to take a leave and go start a company. Now, Terman helped them get funding from, at that time, the, the government, because uh, there was a lot of funding going on. But, um, but that changed the, I think, the trajectory of, of engineering students coming out of Stanford because they had professors who had gone and started their own companies, or at least a lot of them had. And, um, and so it was a kind of a revolving door in, into academia and academia and, and then into business and back into academia. And here's uh, another factor that I think made a big difference in the mindset of Silicon Valley, and that was Hewlett Packard. Uh, I wish, or I, I would hope, that some of the big corporations around here <laughs> would have this as a policy too. I was a, uh, in my freshman year at Stanford, I had a, um, a freshman seminar, eight students, 
with the top international executive at Hewlett Packard. And uh, we, we met on, at Hewlett Packard's office, which is, as I say, on campus on the, the, the industrial park at Stanford. But one of the policies that I thought was really great then, this was in 1968, was that Hewlett Packard, who had thousands of engineers employed by then, um, their policy was that if you wanted to go start a company, if you were an engineer at, at Hewlett Packard and you had your I own idea for a, um, uh, starting a company, Hewlett Packard encouraged you to leave and go start that company. Uh, they wouldn't invest in it, but here's what they did. They guaranteed you a job if you ever wanted to come back. And that was a big, big, I think, influence on uh, how the mindset in Silicon Valley got started. Um, it, you know, it's, it was, it's risky enough to do a startup anyway, but if you, it, it's really nice to have the safety net of some, some company like Hewlett Packard that says, if you leave, that's okay, you're always guaranteed a job here. Um, I think that's a great way to get people to, uh, to go out and, and, and pursue the, their, 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 uh, their dreams. Um, and actually, you know, it's still, I don't think it's the policy. A few months ago, I was talking with some executives at, at Google, and I said, you know, how do you um, attract enough engineers? I mean, that's, that's a big problem, because there's Facebook and, and Apple and all, and all these other companies in the Bay Area, and everybody's looking for the engineers. And these executives said, well, you might be surprised, but um, as a matter of fact, half of the people right now that we employ are former Google employees. So whether it's a policy or not, that's what ends up happening. Is that the, the people leave, they find a startup, at, they, they join Google, then they see a startup they think they want to join, they go do that, and maybe it's successful, maybe not, but then they can always come back to Google because Google's willing to hire people that they've, once, once you've gotten into Google, <laughs> they'll hire you again. Um, and so that happens in Silicon Valley all the time with lots of companies, and I think that it should happen in Europe as well. I don't know that that's uh, uh, a policy, but I do think it would be a huge advantage if, if companies, large corporations, would provide that kind of attitude um, to their employees. It's not disloyal to leave. It's, it's, it's a creative uh, um, advantage uh, to have people that, are, that go out and do their own thing. And then you want them to come back because they're even better trained then, have more experience and, and, and benefit your company um, even more than you, you could have had them benefit it by having, making them stay there. So here's, here's my list of what I think the, the, the values are in Silicon Valley. Creativity, teamwork, fearlessness, sharing ideas, sharing the wealth, you know, owning your own future and giving back. Okay, that set of um, values, I don't think I've found in any other uh, part of the world. In, in, certainly not in such um, intensity, with such intensity for each one of them. I think that, that, uh, that they, they, they sort of epitomize um, what it takes in Silicon Valley to, uh, uh, to fit and to uh, be part of it. Um, I, I will say that there is a program that you probably haven't heard of, but it's been in, in existence for 20 years uh, in Munich. It's called uh, the Center for Digital Technology Management, and it's a joint venture master's honors program between T, uh, TUM and LMU. They have about 600 applicants every year. They accept 40. And in that program, it's all taught in English, um, and it's, it's their entrepreneurs. Uh, it's, a, it's a master's degree, honors master's degree in entrepreneurship. You have to be simultaneously in another master's degree program at either TUM or LMU. And that group of 40 students, are the, they really have adopted these, these sets of values. The only place I've seen in the world, it's the best master's program I've seen in the world academic program to, to create the mindset uh, for entrepreneurship um, uh, like they do. They have, they've, some fantastic company, companies have been born from the uh, associations of, of, among the associations of, of those uh, 
students have gone through CDTM, and it's been going for 20 years, and nobody, hardly anybody in Germany has heard about it. It's incredible to me, but it's, it, it is a great, great program. Um, let's, talk, let's talk a little bit about EA, because people always ask me, how did it get started, and what was it like? I'll just hit some highlights here. Um, yeah, we had five people. All of us were from Stanford Business School, except one who had a master's degree in mechanical engineering uh, from Stanford. We were from um, Harvard, uh, UC Berkeley, Yale, and Stanford as undergrads. None of us knew how to program anything. We were all executives. I was the only one. I had worked at Atari before we started Electronic Arts. The only one had been in the uh, video game industry. None of the others had been. Um, but we were all executives at these companies, and mostly in marketing. So Electronic Arts was a publishing firm, and so our job was to try to um, promote the products of independent authors. And the, the goal that we had was to in, in, infuse uh, computers with something like an emotional uh, uh, engagement for uh, the general public. And this is our first print ad. This, this, this group of uh, people is not, we, we're not in there. Those are the independent artists or programmers that created our first set of products. And the title of this ad, Can a Computer Make You Cry? This is 1983. Just as the home computer business was starting to look like it might become something. Um, that is really embodies what it is we wanted to try to do. Um, and of course, we wanted to promote our, the artists that were, that were creating the content. Um, and we, we hired an L.A. photographer to come pose them. And, stuff. and for many years, our packaging had um, liner notes. We'd put a five and a quarter inch floppy disk in a little eight by eight cardboard box or flat package that had liner notes in like record albums, we had interviews with the artists about how they were, why they wrote what they did, what they wanted to get out of it, how they, how they thought about it. Um, so we w wanted these artists to be able to create a personality for themselves um, that, that, would, that would inspire people. Um, you know, eventually we were able to reach uh, those goals. Let me show you another couple of clips here, videos, uh, interviews with um, a couple of people from the company. One of them was with an artist, but it's, it's, never, it's never been released publicly. We only used it internally. In order for us to do what we uh, are trying to do, we have to be obsessed, and we have to be a little bit arrogant, and we have to be a little bit cocky about uh, having a sense of possibilities that, that are open to us and are open to others because of our convictions. And if we didn't feel that way, if we didn't even have a little bit of a sense of uh, not knowing what we don't know, you know, if, we, if we were too conscious of the pitfalls, if we were too conscious of the obstacles, we might uh, lose our uh, conviction. And uh, we really do have a sense of really being obsessed with it and really believing that we know how to do it better than everybody else. And, and that may seem arrogant, but if we didn't feel that way, we wouldn't be able to pull it off. And it's because we feel that way that we're going to. Okay, so th I show this because it's, it, it is the perfect example, I think, still. That was 1983. Um, and that was our CEO, Trip Hawkins, one of our co-founders. Um, and, you know, he expresses what, uh, what we all felt at that time as co-founders or as founders of uh, this startup. And about uh, in 2012, I was invited to be the first executive director at UC Berkeley's um, startup accelerator that they established called Skydeck. And I can tell you, this is the same attitude that the, uh, the great founders we had at UC Berkeley, that's the same attitude they had, you know, 30, 40 years, well, 35, 36 years later. Um, and so it, that is just the, that, that shows you the kind of thinking that's required. And, and I'd say that the people from CDTM that I know, the young people that I've, I've, I've known there for the last five, six years, they have that same attitude. That's, that's the attitude of a, of a startup founder. Now, here's our, uh, one of our artists. Provide a world where the rules are open ended, where if you're flying around the planet and decide to take off toward that star, you can. I'd like to write some software that interacts with you in a way that's really close to the way a person would interact with you. 
That's why I've been mentioning the idea of a software friend. And that sort of should be built into a computer, but uh, it can be built into a program too. All right, software friend. 1983. Nobody was talking about that kind of stuff. At least not publicly. Um, and, and this was private too. But still, that was, the, that was what we wanted to do. Was to, um, if we'd had the tools and the, uh, 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 the hardware capabilities, um, we, would have, we would have produced a FIFA football back in 83. Um, but, but it just took, it took about 15 years for that to actually all come together. So, um, uh, but that was, that was our dream. That was, that was what we were thinking about back then. Um, it, and, and, and I see now the virtual reality uh, industry is sort of having the same kind of hard time uh, getting going. Um, it reminds me very much of what, what we were doing back in 83 with the home computer industry. And of course, uh, the company still exists. Uh, it just finished its fiscal year with $5 billion in, in revenues. It's very profitable, has no debt, um, and its market value is, uh, as of June 15th, I looked that up, was $45 billion. So it's a big successful company. Um, we made it um, feel like a, uh, we, we created a culture there that, that, that withstand, has withstood 40 years back, uh, 38 years. Um, we also have created how many millionaires? Well, I don't know, but it's hundreds. And each one of those that has become a millionaire as a result of electronic arts, everybody uh, has also invested in other startups in the Bay Area. That's, that's the ethic. That's it's an unwritten rule, but it's not a rule. It's just a, it's just a practice that everybody who makes money on, on uh, startups, they turn around and they invest in other companies that are starting up in order to try to help them also make it. Um, so today, with, the, with AI, and let's call it XR, AR, VR, MR, whatever you want to call it, um, it's the, the intensity level of the in, engagement has just risen tremendously. Um, and, and as I said, if, if, we'd had, if we'd had virtual reality when we started in 83, that's what we would have gone to for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we got to a point of, you know, 2D, um, pretty much engagement, but that has its limitations. And this, this opens up a whole new dimension. Let me show you this little clip about Holodeck VR. It's a Munich company spin out from Fraunhofer in Germany. It's called Location-Based Entertainment. That's Fraunhofer's lab area, test area. So here's a homage to Pac-Man, where you are Pac-Man. You have to run down the, the, the virtual reality hallways or of the Pac-Man maze chasing these gold nuggets. It's a lot of fun, and yet you are completely immersed in it. And you can see it, they're running around in wide open spaces. So th there's an homage to uh, Pong, <laughs> where you're playing, you're the paddle. You have to run back and forth. You can see your partner on the other side of the, of the uh, field or stadium, whatever. And here's an exploration just walking. So you're walking th through nothing, but that's what you see. And the first person is up in the corner. And people are mesmerized by it. So that's the kind of, when I saw that first, uh, the first thing I saw with Holodeck VR was the um, Pac-Man uh, uh, knockoff, if you will. And it was so much fun. I was, I was running back and forth through the maze, and people said to me afterwards, said, well, younger people said, did you go through the walls? Did you run through the walls? And I said, no. It never occurred to me. As far as I was concerned, they were walls. That's what's so powerful about virtual reality, and of course, free-roaming headsets, and they'll get better. There's a lot of stuff that needs to happen to make this a, 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 a much more um, um, interesting for the general public, 
but it's, it's going there. I, 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 I'm, I'm convinced of that. Here's a problem that has arisen just recently, and I was not aware of this so much until the last few months even. And, and of course, we have uh, an issue in the United States that, 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 that um, amplifies the problem, and it's, it's called Trump. Um, but anyway, uh, we can, our eyes and brains can be fooled. And we also, if we hear the same, we hear the uh, uh, same lies over and over again, people start to believe them too. But uh, just here's an example. Deep fakes. I wasn't even aware that this was going on until a few months ago. So, talk about um, fake news. Now there's the capability to have people say things that they don't say, but they look like they're saying it with video. Video special effects. <laughs> and then there's, you know, this guy who would be king, somebody on the internet felt like he'd make, he makes a great queen. <laughs> um, it's hard to tell. I don't, you have to really know to know that that's not him. That isn't he. And this is I. I mean, I can't dance like that. That's my avatar. It's a 3D, three, three-dimensional image of me that, that the company that I, I'm on the board of uh, uh, that has, does three-dimensional... Three um, uh, well, they, they started as a 3D printing company, but anyway, they made me do that dance. Well, I don't know. Uh, as, as things get more sophisticated, that's, 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 I'm just throwing this out there. That's a problem I don't know how to solve. Um, how are we going to cope with this? Right now we have this president that, that, that repeats lies all the time, and, um, and some people don't know how to distinguish between, reality, between truth and lies. Well, it's getting to the point where with video, and, 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 and it's getting to the point where we will end up not being able to distinguish. So my suggestion is a personal ID verification on blockchain. It won't keep the, the fake, deep fakes from occurring, but it will allow peop, all of us to own our own image, and, um, and only you, it will be validated with a seal or something that indicates that, that that's the, the real person in a video or whatever. And, and I think that's, that we're going to have to go to something like that because it's it, with AI coming in and, uh, and affecting video and all that stuff, I think that's, that's uh, a, an issue that we're going to have to face. And I don't know how to solve it right now, but I think it's going to be one that we, we, we will face. So after all these years, I have come up with some things, personal advice to entrepreneurs. And... Um, I, you know, the first one is that when you start a company, you should select only the people that you believe are the smartest, most talented people that you know. Um, it, the people are what make a company uh, succeed, absolutely, unequivocally. Second, you need to try to make the biggest impact you can possibly imagine. Change the world, and that's something that Europeans have not fully adopted yet. So I want everybody to think big. Also, you need to be honest and true to yourself, even when it doesn't give you the advantage. And that's hard to do throughout a lifetime, but especially in a startup, too. Um, the, the fourth is that people don't say this very often, but loads of money, and I can say this personally, doesn't deliver happiness or contentment necessarily. You need to do what you're passionate about. Forget about the money. And finally, you've got to give back. Uh, you're the most privileged and fortunate person in the world to have the experience of being an entrepreneur. So you've you got to share it. Now, people have often asked me, Jeff, you know, it's, it's, um, isn't it kind of too late to start? There's too many com uh, startup companies. And, and as far as I'm concerned, my answer is um, no. Uh, this is the best time in my lifetime to start a company. And I think the epitome or the, 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 the epitome of uh, what the mentality in Silicon Valley is you got to wear shades. Bright future. Thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> awesome. My prop. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Jeff, thanks very much. Um, I need to get the clicker back. Thanks. <laughs> now that's. Uh, it's yours. But it's connected to the computer. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so, <clears throat> bad luck to you. No, no, we get it back. You get it back. I'll, I'll not forget it. Thanks very much. Awesome uh, keynote talk. We'll discuss later some questions in the. Um, yeah, I love the, those glasses. <laughs> awesome. Uh, some questions in the panel. And with that, I would like to give the stage to Klaus Bauer, uh, who is uh, from the uh, company Trump that we had already um, in this conference uh, on the occasion of the reception on uh, Monday morning. You are responsible for uh, what we would call enabling technologies or basic technologies at uh, Trump. In particular, he's an expert in um, human machine interaction, software architectures, and systems engineering. Um, <clears throat> his uh, keynote talk will very much focus on the topic of AI in the context of Industry 4.0. And I'm also happy to have you later on in the uh, panel uh, discussion then. Thanks very much to your stage. Please welcome Klaus Bauer. Thank you very much. So now it's not easy for me to stand after Jeff here on the stage. It was a wonderful presentation. So, and I cannot copy this. I can just make a total different presentation about AI and a smart factory. So, I'm from a, a Trumpf company. All of you maybe know after these uh, days where we are. So, I did not talk about what we really do um, in the company, but our business is not games, our business is production machines and all the stuff around to enabling smart factories to make our customers successful so they can be, uh, become millionaires. To do this, our business started um, decades ago building machines like this one. And this is the basic start point in every uh, factory. And so this is also the start point of my presentation. Because if you want to build a factory because you have one great idea, you need one of these production systems to make your uh, idea happen. And what you can do with a machine, you cannot imagine before, before you guess about everything the machine is built for. And the machine is built for flexibility. So it's not built to make a real part you know did not know the geometry. You can do everything with this. And this is a great chance. But this is also our, um, our thing for us. We have to enable to make everything possible in this machine, for every material, for every geometry. And this is what we sell, and this is what we did in the past, and what we also want to do in the future, to enable the best machines, the highest quality, the best availability, to enable uh, the best cutting on these machines and other things. And for this, we decided uh, 20 years ago for architecture, which enables us much more things, in the future because of information technology behind and a lot of data, a terabyte per hour inside every machine. And if we show some problems to make a machine more um, flexible and in a bigger quality, sometimes we get some problems, for example, with tipping points. Normally, every part should be fall down and the programmers um, have to do a good job with experience, but very often they, they have problems. The parts did not fall. They, they did not have the experience. They have no chance to do because the physics of the gas and the laser power and, and um, about everything around uh, is not uh, describable. So we have no uh, model for this. And we will never get a model for this. <laughs> and because of this, we started a new thinking in our company. Not engineers have to solve the problem completely with a mathematical model. So we, we looked on gaming industries. <laughs> we looked 
how do they uh, learn about players, about uh, virtual images, and they use this AI. And we did also use this, our physics models combined with AI without uh, a lot of um, tests with it. And then we learn a model and we give this model to another place, to the programmers, not to the machine. Now the programming system gets more smarter because of all these machines have experience and uh, give this experience back to the uh, programmers to make it happen that each part falls. But if we started about uh, new dimensions of thinking about new mindsets in the company, um, we started not with this AI project. This is one of the newest. We started with the old problem um, we have to uh, predict about uh, when uh, have the operator go to the machine and change some parts. Um, and if they look for the nozzle here, for example, um, this pointer, uh, this one, this one um, and he goes to the machine and he'll uh, turn it out and looks and say, oh, it's okay. And then go back to the machine. And in this time, the machine did not work. And you need an expert to guarantee he makes a right decision. So we started to make models about uh, the physics with sensors to predict if it's okay or not. And we did it for a lot of things inside a machine. So. This is a, a similar uh, example for lens, and um, I would not go to the medical model system. So, but humans cannot interpret this things what the sensor delivers. They need help. Um, they need an easy operating uh, system, and just uh, a situation if have I to have I to do something, or does the machine work the next hours or not? And to predict these lines uh, here between red and yellow and green, we have to do a lot of experience, uh, a lot of tests in our test beds and so on. And this takes a lot of time and money. And we cannot do this in one machine. And we cannot do this in one machine if we want to predict the future. One machine is not enough again. We need now thousands of machines. All machines we have in field. The big problem here is all these machines are located everywhere in the world. And a typical customer of us have one or two of these machines. So we have 30,000, 50,000, 70,000 machines all around the world. And we need the data from these machines and we have to connect these machines. And for this, we started 20 years ago to connect every machines to, to uh, systems. They did not are uh, called cloud uh, 20 years ago, but since about 10 years ago, we call this cloud systems. And our uh, platform behind um, started 2010. We was the, the first manufacturer of machine tools having our own cloud without um, the big players in the field like Google or so, because they are not able in this time to help us. But what we learned now, yes, we have, we have a lot of ideas and we can do this, but we get problems there. This is not state of the art in the near future. This is state of the art of the past, what we do here. And we will not have success if we just follow this one path of thinking. We have to do, to think about completely other ways of thinking. And what could this happen? Now we did go back to the field um, and just listen what happened outside. Just listen now. So this is just a two-hour movie. Uh, I uh, stop it now. What you can hear, the machine makes sounds. And it makes different sounds. Depend 
what the machine is doing. And if we look about this, the service guys, what they uh, called from the customers, they have a lot of calls. They said, my machine make noises I never had before. And some of the experts can imagine what the noise are, uh, what the reason for the noise is. But I need this operator with years of experience. But the big problem is if we bring new machines to field and we do this every year, every month, where are the experienced people in the field? If you buy a machine now and get it tomorrow and you have to work, you have experience in five or ten years. So we have to do a different way here with a microphone. Um, make experience with machine learning models and use this to help everybody who need this help. And this is what we did. We used the available technology like a smartphone to learn about the problems and we uh, learned a model behind and now we have solutions. If there is a problem in the field, you just take your phone, record the problem and send it to the cloud and get a prediction what could be happened. And this is the new world. And we learned this also from, from you, Jeff. Think new, have ideas, and believe on your ideas, and just try it. Because if we started this uh, project in our company and told uh, the, the management what we want to do, they say it's not possible. No, never. We did not did this in the past. But we found people who believe on this idea, on, on this solution, and now we, we got results for this. And because we, we have a lot of these things um, to connect machines to help the peoples. We also did this virtual image from the machines to help the in-house service, which, is, which are the organization who helps the, the machine operators in the field. And with this image, we can do a lot of more things. And we have to do a lot of more things, not only for prediction to help the customers on our service call. No, we have to do to ensure that the machines are really needed. They are available now. They are the best machines in the field and they are not alone. There are more than one machine because typical orders in a smart factory are complex, a complex value change also inside and you have to organize this. And this is also a problem we can see some games had solved but with a lot of special issues. And now we need solutions, find the right path on the right time to have uh, no storage there or less storage there and to use the machines the whole time they are available. The machines did not want to wait because this is a loss of, this is a waste of money. And what this means, if you want to do a car like this, and this should be an individualized car because the customer want to select uh, how the, uh, the wheels are looking and so on, you need a lot of machines to do this. And you normally have to connect a lot of software, we did this, and the result is uh, on a trade show, we worked uh, with, with our sales departments to make the showcase happen. Every customer get a voucher to order an individual car. And it's not um, just to wait uh, after three days because on a trade show, the customer is only one day. <laughs> and what we did, um, if we get a lot of, uh, enough of orders, we uh, prepare this automatically, send this automatically to the machines, and then the first parts was produced in the first step. They marked individual uh, with a dot matrix code because every 
car we built there is unique. And we also uh, had the need to send uh, information to the customer what happens with his car. Because after two hours, normally he wants to have a car to go to another station, to go home, to go everywhere, but not to wait. We learned this from Amazon. <laughs> um, you want to have information if you buy something by Amazon and you want to have it immediately. And this is what we have to realize there. And we also uh, realized uh, some of the strategy, the machines did not really know what to do. The order knows what the machines have to do. And we also can correlate this and we also integrate the humans there. And this was not the big issue. This was the show. The big issue was behind the scenes, so because every customer got his car in time and this was all working and he got all these messages and this was a trade show and this was very successful but behind the time, uh, behind the scenes there happened something more. On the first day with all the experts uh, we just could build 190 cars. But with the data we collect and with the experts who look on the data and with the tools, with the same factory, with the same machine, with the same configuration, we are able in day four to make about three times more cars. And this is what's the benefit of connecting machine, of having smart factories, not only 30%. It's about 200 or 300 percent of more output and this is where you can earn money with the same machine park, with the same invention in hardware. hardware. And, uh, and it's necessary to do because we see in our customers in the past they have big lot sizes, not individualized project. Now they have small lot sizes, about 10 pieces from one order which never comes again, and we have to optimize other things we did before. Not a machine, the machines are fast enough. We have to do optimizing the, the factory itself. And how to do this? We need now virtual reality things, simulations, because we cannot build this machine before. We have to simulate this, and then we have to check which is the best option. And we use this data to learn the machine learning models. This is uh, one of the next steps, because if you build a factory and have the, the house around and send all this machine there, there's no chance to move it again. You have to do this before. And you also have to help the customers, because some of the things are not automated. And you need also help them um, to say what to do with the piece they collect. To say, collect the first piece here, is not working because he's standing on the other side. It's not usable. Now, the process is he collects what is reachable and then the camera system sees this and connects this with the order plan and say then the operator where to put the things. And this is have information, have tools, help, help them and um, you have to connect also the environment all around the smart factory, about the complete value change, about the order management, about the purchasing processes and reporting. And if you can do this, and this is my last video, you can have fun.
Thank you. Clark. Thanks very much. If a head of productions in future worlds uh, will go uh, and date in New York bars while they manage their production facility, that was that. That's a smart new world. Very much looking forward to that. Thanks very much for your keynote, and please join us on our panel. And I would like to also call up Jeff onto the panel, and I would like to introduce and welcome two further panelists. Uh, first one is uh, Pascal Stiegelmann. He is um, of the owner's family of IKA, uh, one of those companies that I've frequently talked about, those medium-sized world market leaders in their niche type of Baden-Württemberg companies. In that particular example, they are ladies in laboratory analytical and processing uh, technologies, and they have spun out a, a company that's Real World One, where Pascal is uh, the CEO, um, and Real World One is in the VR, AR field, and as I understand, the original idea was to support their own training uh, procedures. Please join us on stage. Pascal, thanks very much for joining and supporting, and then I would like to introduce Armin Pohl, who is the CEO of Macavision. He's one uh, very visionary CEO here, transforming yeah. the company from a stage of more or less a dozen uh, companies into something that was just acquired uh, this year, February, I think the closing was, you said, uh, by Accenture and is now a key part of the strategy of Accenture in the field of 3D visualization uh, and computer-generated um, graphics. Please join us on stage. Um, please have a um, seat here. Maybe we put the uh, seat just uh, forward a little bit so you don't uh, catch your hands. Thanks very much for joining here. And um, the topic of the panel actually is uh, VR and AR. And um, yes, we have very different views here. Obviously, uh, computer-generated uh, uh, graphics, uh, images in particular in the automotive field and uh, marketing and sales. A uh, Klaus here, the uh, human machine interface, I guess, the industrial application. Jeff, you have this view on a gaming and entertainment industry. and. Uh, for you, it's more about the training. But before we step into this, um, Pascal, if I may ask you, uh, this is one of those examples where a very classy family-owned business actually went from a more traditional industrial context really into what we now call the digital world. Uh, could you just share a bit of, you know, what were the motivations? How did this do? You know, did you have to, you know, have hard arguments? Was it an easy task? Maybe you could just... Uh, um, Explain sure, a bit of, about sure. that. So, um, as you mentioned, we are a medium-sized company. Uh, we have roughly a thousand employees, and uh, we develop laboratory analytical and processing equipment mainly for the chemical and the pharmaceutical and the food industries. We are really good in what we do. We have great engineers working around the around the world. Uh, we have great product innovation in our traditional fields, um, and this is kind of a conservative uh, business, traditional business that. Um, works very well. Uh, we live from this business and we love the business, but at the same time we know that the world is constantly changing just as it has been changing in the past and technologies are constantly changing and there are new technologies arising and uh, we are thinking about the future of our company of course. So uh, we see it as our responsibility uh, to, to deal uh, with the latest technologies and with the most uh, call it maybe revolutionary technologies or with, with the technologies that are going to massively impact our, the daily lives from all of us, but also from our industry segment. And virtual reality is just such an incredible um, technology. When we first um, were, were dealing with the technology in 2015, we were directly extremely impressed by, by the sense of presence and by the technology. And there was no doubt for us that this is going to be the next major step in computing platforms, just like the tech industry also also says. Um, so we, we are creating a virtual reality platform, a multiplayer-based virtual reality platform for science and for the industry, where um, training is a big part in it, definitely. Mm -hmm. Companies can use virtual reality as an excellent tool for training, but it's also an environment where people will be able to meet and talk to each other. Uh, where companies have a, can have a representative space, show all their instruments fully functional, 
um, to potential customers, to, to sales representatives of their customers or service people, um, but also creating a space for scientists mm -hmm. to communicate on their, on their daily research problems, for example. So for us, it's really about creating this, this a community, basically, in virtual reality for science and for the industry. And we're very passionate about 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 um, this spin-off company, about this project, and um, strongly believe in the future of virtual reality okay. and augmented reality. Perfect. Thanks very much. And and I mean, um, I mean, I'm just uh, because there's this overarching theme on the conference, uh, a bit about transforming the industrial landscape, also in Baden-Württemberg, as a challenge. And so one option, of course, is that traditional companies, you know, by themselves. Um, step into this new world. In your case in particular, this is an example where a, an innovative uh, market leader actually was acquired. In your case, uh, um, you uh, merged uh, with Accenture. And as I understand it, uh, Accenture uh, perceives uh, the competence of microvision as an option to step into new applications. And at the same time, uh, as I understand, microvision or your vision was that Accenture uh, helps uh, that business to grow in a more global span. So it is an example where, uh, well, Microvision was not exactly a startup, but you know, just taking the model of a smaller, very innovative company and a larger incumbent merged in order to uh, benefit for both sides. Could you, you know, just elaborate a bit of uh, on your experience? I know it's just a few months down the road after that deal, but. What were your considerations, your initial experiences here? What is your expectation, how this is going to pay out for uh, uh, the both partners here? Um, oh, okay, so there are a lot of topics we could tap in in, in, I in, your, in, in your question. Um, first of all, so Megavision was started as a classic video post-production company in uh, end of 95, so that's long years ago, and uh, we uh, were really developing, um, not really on a strategic level, but uh, that started 12 years ago, so where we uh, realized, okay, um, servicing just uh, agencies or the automotive companies around here uh, is a nice thing, but it's it's not uh, bringing us forward. So we, we're following a clear strategy, and this is a little bit coming to uh, what uh, Jeff said in the beginning, so uh, what could be um, helpful advice for entrepreneurs? Uh, so we were building a strategy, and we were following it. We were believing into that, and uh, we were trying to stay ourselves and stay true on it. So and, and we decided only to do things which we are passionate about. And that probably is not a guarantee to be successful, but um, it's far better than going to play uh, your money in a lottery and uh, so we were very soon focused on the automotive industry makes some good sense in the region here and the second business stream we're doing is visual effects uh, for um, maybe familiar with Game of Thrones or um, um, Lost in Space or these things and or also did some things for um, other big shows like Independence Day and I would say okay the one is mainly focused on the automotive industry taking engineering data and um, building this up for being able to um, visualize the complete product range and all variations to all devices and in all channels simulta simultaneously. So that's an industrial approach and this is what makes the difference of being a rendering house or building something which is scalable um, in, 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 yeah, in big numbers as well. And we, develop, we developed a lot of technology <coughs> to enable our customers to still have a uh, creative input for the agencies into that pipeline. And this is what we run, uh, realized with the changing world of our customers, uh, which is always important for us. And um, again, it comes exactly to what Pascal said. Um, you need to stay fresh. You need to uh, reinvent your company in a permanent um, in, a, in, a, in a permanent way so because if you're not making yourself obsolete somebody else will do and uh, so we never uh, want to wait for that because there are so many smart young people out there having lots of ideas so we're always trying to challenge ourselves like can this be done better or what would be the next step and so the learning what the automotive industry um, is um, having in front of them yesterday you learned a lot about that um, that is impacting our business um, depending to 85 percent of our revenue news on the automotive industry um, gives us the thought of how could we help them to sell more and better and what does it mean if you're handling data of a car uh, which will be in future connected with data of the users because there might be not only uh, an owner of a car but a user group and where is the car placed and so on. So you, you learned a lot about that yesterday and so we understood that we need to develop us um, being an end-to-end -end provider really um, 
um, seeing that uh, an, a Daimler would be probably a competitor to Amazon or the other way around, or are they partners or whatever. So the world is going to be very complex. And so we thought um, we need to add more um, know-how in the IT sector. We need to add more know-how in really being front-end developers because we are mainly delivering content. And uh, so we started to work on project by project base uh, with huge companies like Accenture, like IBM, uh, like uh, lots of other big names you are all aware of. And uh, so we, uh, we thought mm, if we are going to proceed um, with our way, we're being in competition with them, which is not making us uh, fearful or so, but uh, we thought maybe there is a smarter way. And, and uh, so we were very strategically entering into a dialogue with just a handful of companies where we thought they have the global approach, uh, which we think is needed for that and who have the money to um, probably in, invest. And so we weren't looking for investment money, which is a lot there on the market and a classical PE sector, um, but um, Accenture in the, in the end was the right choice because it's not only um, how you um, were putting it that um, what is in for Mac Vision, what is in for Accenture, that's a very natural outcome if you think what is in for the customer. So um, mm -hmm. this is always the approach, uh, what is our added value to the market? And uh, now the really being able to deliver something from end to end, First of all, in the automotive sector, there will be also mm. things in, um, in industrial equipment and in consumer goods. And we are having a pilot project with Trump uh, at, at the moment. So um, we'll see that's very, um, very promising what, uh, what's going on there. We have also um, uh, some kind of virtual validation platform going on with Bosch. So um, visualization from marketing and, 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 and sales is moving into a supporting engineering processes. So. Mm. The world is going to be far more complex than uh, we had this in the past, and uh, we are amazed uh, with now being part of Accenture. As difficult as it might be for some of our people to be now part of a of a huge monster of four hundred and sixty thousand people, but it doesn't feel like so. Um, okay. It's it's a really cool bunch. Um, uh, it's it's a high performance intelligence network. So this is what I'm experiencing, and everybody is um, really very helpful and supportive to to make us feel home. Bring me actually to hear that. Thanks very much for the insight into that, Jeff. I know you're traveling the world quite a lot, um, and um, you know uh, it's it's kind of uh, not a very common uh, thing that someone coming over from the Silicon Valley would invest in a German startup like you did in Holodeck VR. I know that in the CGI field and also in VR AR, there tends to be uh, very good startups. In Germany, in particular, also established companies. If we think about CGI in the film industry, for example, so what is your view on the on the global scene of that technology? Would you think that Germany is uh, kind of you know situated very well here? Uh, what do you observe? Well, the, the the educational systems in well, first of all, in general, educational systems in the world are failing. I think our young people. Um, but there's been such a strong uh, emphasis in, in, in Germany and, and other uh, EU members um, for enough years that the, 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 the talent level is really, really high. That's why I come here to talk with, to find uh, startups who I think have t a tremendous amount of p potential. And what, as I said before, I think there's a tendency in Europe not to appreciate the the abilities that you have right in, in, inside and 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 not to be able to uh, somehow or another there's a there's a reticence to let the world know what a fantastic operation you're running what how much how much education you're you're, you're providing just on the job um to to your employees and 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 the new innovations that you're creating that's it now that the, the U.S. could be argued uh, to be abdicating its role in the, the world, and it's, it's a perfect time, I think, for the EU to step up mm -hmm. and take, take the leadership roles. I don't know that, that you want to particularly, but I, you've certainly got the capacity to do it. And, and I would encourage all of you to, to, to try to adopt that attitude. Now, this is the perfect time in the world to, to um, assume your the rightful role that that Europe should be playing in leading the world because the U.S. isn't going to do it anymore at least not as long as we have our our, our Trump problem um, and and so I, I I'm I'm just amazed and when I see stuff that you're doing 
it's it's fantastic. I haven't seen that in in uh, Silicon Valley. Maybe I'm not looking in the right places, but it's it's here, and it's um, you, you've got the talent, you've got the skills, you've got the the accomplishments. When I hear you talking about all of this stuff, I'm thinking with VR. You know, I of course love the idea of entertaining, being entertained with it, but it's really a powerful educational tool. I mean. Um, th that can transform the way people learn so quickly and easily. It's and and, and the fact that you're applying it in in um, um, in the automobile uh, automobile industry, um, uh, I I just find that that for me that's the way to change the world is is to educate people in in, in a different different method and 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 I think VR can do that and you guys are doing that. You're the stuff you're learning have learned. In, uh, on, in, in involving factories and, and and the whole process that you laid out there is uh, a, a fantastic accomplishment and 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 I think it's, it should be applauded. I mean, and and it should be exposed to the rest of the world. That's that's the that's the thing that somehow or another it hasn't been, and okay. and I, I'd I'd love to to, to see it. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Jeff. If I take on your you know, revolution kind of, uh, you know, projection <laughs> on, on, on what the, the impact of VR and AR is. Klaus, I mean, looking at, in particular, also the application that Jeff showed, you know, Pac-Man, for example. Uh, one, one way to look at it would be to say, well, we, we or Pong, you know, okay. Uh, it's a reference, uh, so I, it's, it's kind of neat, but uh, a different way to look at it is to say, well, we, we had Pac-Man, so we had Pong, and now we do the same thing just using kind of a well, you know, more fancy approach to it. Okay, it it's surely is better and fancier and so on. Uh, another way to look at it was saying, well, it's it's not that we do the things that we did yesterday just with different means. It it you know allows us to do fundamentally different things, and it's more like a disruption type of technology. What's your view on that? Is it more like like doing things a little bit you know differently, better, whatever? Or is it really disrupting, also disrupting in organizations? And, and how is that, in your view, if that is the case, going to happen? Yes, to do only a little bit better is not enough because everybody can do this. So we have to disrupt, really, and we have to disrupt the own organization. We have to completely change mindsets, but not to make a mistake, to lose the experience of the past to combine with the good things and the experience of the past and disrupting with the new thing, this is the next level. Because we have to earn the money with the things we have today. And they are value in the market. And we should not get rid of them. But we can add complete different things to it. Not only selling a machine and a remote service for this machine, selling a new experience, how to be successful with these machines. And not mm -hmm. only with this one from Prom side, also with all the competitor stuff in the smart factory. Because mm -hmm. we know there is competitor stuff in every smart factory. They did not buy the things from us. And so we have to connect this. And this is a challenge, mm -hmm. a challenge from the data, how to bring these simulations to make the augmentation or to, to make uh, the, simul uh, the, the virtualization together from different parts of partners or competitors, which is very a separate level. <laughs> so, sure. because sometimes it's easier to work with a competitor <laughs> and yeah. sometimes it's only possible to, to work with a partner. But we have to disrupt both thinkings. Not the one is better than the other. And then we, we have a challenge with the new technologies. And they are getting started to be robust enough. They are now working. We have the right use experience feeling. Mm. And the time is now ready. Okay. If I take your notion, uh, in particular what you said about integrating also uh, you know, competitive products, that, that kind of... Uh, uh, for me, seems to, to to hint into the direction of platforms, so that 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 VR AR very much also may turn into a pl platform-driven business. Uh, I mean, uh, Pascal, what's your experience in that? Is is the the platform notion a very important 
uh, uh, consideration when you think about you know how you want to expand and grow your business and how you also further develop your technology? Definitely. I mean, the use of virtual reality or augmented reality. Today we call it virtual and augmented reality. We have two technologies. Let's at some point they're probably going to merge together into one technology. Let's talk maybe call it virtualities. The use and the benefit of these technologies is there for everyone. So that's also. Um, kind of our motivation. We've, we've developed our virtual reality platform um, out of the experience that we have from the daily business of ICA, where we, we know exactly what the problems of industrial companies are. And we're specifically developing solutions and tools for industrial companies and for scientists around the world. So um, if we develop this uh, out of our experience and also for, our, for, for the mother company, ICA, why not have other companies around the world participate in this technology, mm -hmm. use this technology and benefit from the technology. And at the same time, um, the, the idea is to, to really have a space inside virtual reality where, I mean, people from all over the world can meet. Um, if you think about how much time and how much money companies today spend for, um, for traveling, for example, or for exhibitions or for sales trainings, um, or, or the, the salespeople in general. So this is a general problem every industrial company has. Mm -hmm. Salespeople today mm -hmm. explain the same products over and over again for years. They spend 80% of their time in explaining the same products to potential customers. This is a waste of their intelligence. That's a waste of their time, actually. So virtual reality for us also is a new way of... Um, it's a new information platform we can mm -hmm. create content inside virtual reality. We can also record content. We can bring a technical spe specialist inside virtual reality. We have fully functional instruments in there. And we can record what people explain mm -hmm. about this instrument inside virtual reality. And um, then show this content to potential customers, just to talk about sales. So this is a general yeah. problem that all industrial companies have and a tool that everyone can benefit from. Mm. So sure. I mean, if we develop great technology, share it to everyone who's interested in, in, in using it. Yeah. And also help, this, this also helps the virtual reality community to grow. And actually, we recognize that there is really a great interest in virtual reality from, from companies. We have a really great co uh, collaboration with SIG, for example. And they're super interested in virtual reality. They have, um, they, they, they have a variety of projects uh, they, they are now working on also with us. And um, we're talking to the leading companies out of our branch, mm. and we run into great interest uh, about virtual okay. reality. So the interest okay. is there, the benefit is there with today's technology. Okay. And yeah. let's see what, what, what things will look like also in five years. I mean, yeah. like yeah, okay. that's, that's, that's always the issue. Now, if I could see how the world would look like in five years, I would be up on the screen on my yacht in you know, Barbados and so on. I mean, so te technologically, technologically, <laughs> technologically, technologically <laughs> what the virtual reality yeah. hardware will look like. Yeah. That, that, that certainly, and if, in, in particular, if you, if you mention that human factor, uh, I mean, if I, if I may ask, so if, if I look at this whole thing, you know, mixed reality, computer generated, uh, uh, you know, imagery, um, there seem to be at least two technology layers, so software and, and still some specialized hardware. But it's also, there's also this creativity aspect. I mean, yeah, if, if we look at, you know, uh, the, uh, the immersive character of, of the gaming experiences you've shown us, uh, uh, Jeff, and one would think about, you know, what to do with this. Um, certainly, it's not an engineer creating that. So it's some, you know, storytellers and whatever. What's your experience on that? Like, because these are disciplines that typically are like way, you know, far away from each other. Typically, would not work in the same space, not work on the same, or at least would only work the Disney way. So very sequentially. So you start with the storytellers, and then, you know, at the end, you have the the doors. Um, how did you do that in, uh, you know, Macro Vision? And how was your experience of that interdisciplinary uh, uh, interaction here? So um, sometimes I have the impression I'm running a zoo, and um, this uh, this comes because we really have people who are engineers or um, have their uh, 
degree of doctor in physics and there are creatives who haven't been uh, seen any university and this is not an issue where you're coming from it's just do you have the right mindset to, to be able to work in a team and what is your contribution to that and uh, we're trying to have a um, really permanent exchange between the disciplines uh, so um, really trying not to build silos uh, if you're then going into a scalable business for uh, long-term uh, contracts with customers, uh, then you have people who are doing on an ongoing basis the same things. Uh, but we're uh, really trying to have an, also an, an individual ex exchange and that uh, also everybody who, uh, there are lots of intelligence in the company and that, uh, that they have on a platform where they can place their ideas and where we also have um, um, shootouts and quotations where people say, uh, um, it's not in the end a democratic process, so in the end it's always about budgets and uh, do we have an opportunity to sell this to the market, but mm -hmm. um, everybody can be heard and, and uh, can, can influence this. And this is how we're trying to develop our things forward. So it's it's not a sequence that um, some kind of a an, uh, an, an creative guy is doing something um, about a storytelling. It's always a combination of uh, what do we have in technology and what is the best idea to make uh, the, the best effect with that technology. Mm. So it's it's an really a, 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 um, using both parts of the brain and, and if you just say, hey, VR is a cool thing, so what? It's just mm. a tool. So uh, you, c you can use a stone if you have the right idea to use it. And uh, telling a story, okay, is always influenced by what is um, the, uh, the, the, the technology I'm using. So storytelling has been changed from um, doing paintings, um, which was um, some kind of, um, not only decoration, what we today believe, but uh, the kings of the past have been telling their stories on, on, on huge screens, but this was just a picture painted with oil mm. colors, uh, but uh, there was no other um, way of documenting things, and that was not a documentation, that was, I wouldn't say fake news, but that they were always tuning reality. So that, that mm. happened with day one, when the first um, man uh, was uh, standing in the cave, that was an interpretation of reality. And so it's because this tool and this brain was able to do that. Mm. And uh, so VR now is just a next technology, and the creators need to think around, okay, what can we do with that? And mm. storytelling will be changed dramatically, not only in the gaming engine, so there will be gaming, and cinematic uh, um, storytelling is getting closer and I've been standing already in the cave uh, with smoke, uh, with, with smoke and, and uh, Lord of the Rings and when you're standing there with a VR um, a device on your head and uh, the dragon is just moving over you and uh, then you realize, okay, um, normally the director of a, of, a, of, a, of a film has the chance to guide the audience because if the video is, uh, is, is in the film is edited so the angle of the camera and, and so you, you're really taking somebody by the hand and, and you're, you're just getting dragged away so now you're standing in an environment and maybe audio is far more important because you need some orientation and then you have a cut into the next scenery and say so, whoa what's that so and this field is completely untouched at the moment. It's uncharted mm. territory. And I believe um, the right, um, bright creative minds will use these technologies in, in a way we can't even think about today. Yeah. And then I'm totally with you. So let's see what's, uh, what's in there in five or 10 years. And uh, depends on uh, what, what the real world and politics is uh, letting us do. Because um, the, the Trump problem you have been just mentioning uh, is um, more or less international thing. So it's not that Europe is at the moment really on the run. So, hey, there is that space and the Americans are busy with themselves. And uh, so uh, we are now taking the lead as the last uh, outpost of democratic um, uh, nations. The reality is that um, all over the industrial um, nations and, uh, and, and uh, the, I don't know the percentage, but part of them are just not part of digitalization, are not part of mm. globalization. And if we are not being careful in believing, oh, it's such a nice future, we are moving ourselves into that and we are letting behind half of, uh, of the people uh, that could be firing back in an uh, absolutely unwanted way. And all the dreams of how nice the future could be um, are um, s simply just going away. And if you're looking mm. back in history for hundreds or thousands of years, um, if you're losing a too big portion um, of the people in the country, uh, you get some kind of negative energy, which is making you lose probably all of yeah. your achievements in the past. And this is uh, coming back to the one thing I, I saw on your slides. And yeah, the, we, we have um, uh, we have a task here all together, mm -hmm. and not um, just being blind for um, for. for probably a growing um, part and someday a majority in, in important uh, countries um, that we are trying to 
um, let the others be part of the, uh, this development and not uh, um, um, being careful not to be arrogant. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and uh, I'm, I'm, I can't say more to that, but I, I think that's um, that's the biggest difficulty we have in front of us about yeah. uh, talking about digitalization. And, and no, uh, if, if we don't have a, a, a prosperous economy, nobody will buy any products. Um, yeah, and right. So that's it. So yeah, we've, we've, um, when, when we had the reception at the ministry and on Monday evening, we already touched a bit into this this notion of future of work and uh, you know the digital divide and the social impact of that, the potential po uh, a social impact of that. Is certainly a challenge in this this uh, you know whole movement or phenomenon um, of digital transformation and 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 surely uh, you know if we cannot take care or if we don't manage to take care of that you know we do not need to care too much about the technology side because that was really as relevant as happening on the streets and uh, you know if there's something positive about Trump is that it is kind of a revolution but it is within the institutions and not with guns on the street right so it's still the mildest form of that if you like. Uh, but let's say, you know, turning that a little bit around into uh, the, the technology angle again, uh, you know, what I find fascinating about this whole thing, it's, it's kind of a mix of different dimensions, you know, and, and uh, we've talked about mixed reality, uh, talked about mixed qualification, then uh, another thing is the role of, of data, data analytics, you know, AI, what you pointed out before, uh, what's your view on that? Is, does, does AI, big data, play a big role in uh, the further development class? Yes, sure. Without the data, we are not able to make the simulation which is needed for a good experience for with our reality. So we need this data, and we need this data not only on a single point. So we have more enabling technology for communication, for example. Maybe a 5G environment could be help some to solve some technical problems with latency of networks. Um, if we want to control with this new virtual realities technologies combined with data behind artificial intelligence, we have to do this in, in a real time. It's not a, the right word because it's different in machinery, uh, business real time um, than in normal, uh, economies, um, but we have to do it at the right time, mm -hmm. not with a delay of seconds, so with a delay of milliseconds. Mm -hmm. And and then the German issue is you also uh, have to be told about security, about all the issues of security of data, of the personality, because if we saw your demos uh, with Mr. Trump, um, uh, yes, blockchain can solve something, but it's not the only technology. Yeah. So we, we have all this, what's called trustworthiness behind the safety features from the technology for robots and also the personality, data, security, things. Thank you. And, uh, you know, please uh, uh, keep seated. I just wanted to open round for questions from the audience. So uh, I think we still have time. Uh, I'm very sorry. I I, uh, I keep the tradition of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, not keeping the time schedule. I'm very sorry about that. But uh, I still would like to you know, give the chance to one or two questions from the audience, um, if there is one. There is one. Yeah. Um, j just more of an ob observation. Um, we're looking at different fields of technology. We're looking at the retail sectors. We're looking at manufacturing. One of the key things that we, we should remember is that behind these technologies is still basic engineering, which then moves on to smart engineering. And I think it's important for us to keep that in mind because when we introduced things like just-in-time management, everybody jumped in, they optimized all the processes, one slight failure and the whole system comes down. How, how do we guard against some of these pushes where everybody wants to be totally optimized take the best sort of opportunities, but not realizing the basic practice that they should follow. I think it's more a technical question, yeah. Charles, would you feel comfortable in answering? <laughs> yeah, I, I cannot answer directly your question, because there's multi-dimensions of, of, of the answers, but on industry, the only thing is to earn money. 
And if, if we cannot find a solution to earn money, we cannot prioritize a new technology and our process. So keep this in mind. <laughs> but I have no solution for your answer. But if there is no value behind all we are doing, if it's only fun, and fun is a value for gaming, but not for industry, then we have to make other decisions. But, uh, yeah. I would say just that the, the, the gaming, um, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, this uh, Pac-Man and, and, and Pong. Those, to me, are gateway drugs. I mean, to allow masses to mm -hmm. easily understand the power of... Of, of complete immersion and, and, and a presence in, 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 a, in a different reality. Then, once we, because that will then build more and more people and get more and more people involved and not leave people behind. You know, it can get, everybody can, can enjoy that and understand it. And that will lead to uh, a, a, uh, an economic um, uh, imperative that, that then leads to the, the industri industrial uh, use of these kinds of things too, and, and, and educational and all that stuff. So, I think that, that it's it's a matter of time and just just spreading. How many t you know, when 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 how long did it take for smartphones to get to what is it two or three billion now in, in the world? Yeah. That's that's including so many people that have never been included before in this. Right. So, so, this, so we're, it's it's moving that direction. I think. I see. Perfect. Thanks very much. I would like to right. give with that very good statement to finish that uh, panel. Thanks very much to my panelists for joining me here. And um, as a tradition of this conference, I would like Yay. to heartfully say <laughs> thank you very much to you. I mean, thanks very much for joining. Klaus, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Hey, so, thank you. You get one too. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Pascal, for joining us. We have basically three items on the list. The first item is that we're going to hand out um, the uh, final award that is still um, outstanding. Uh, I'm very pleased that I can see the award winner already in the room. That's pretty helpful. Uh, and then um, we will um, show a little bit of a video. You've seen this here. That's, uh, uh, it, it, there is uh, this team of uh, Maurice Rickert, um, who has uh, yeah, accompanied us for the last three days. And basically, uh, during the day they were filming and during the night they were cutting. And uh, so we managed to have a little bit of a two, three minutes impression video um, for that conference that we would show after the uh, awards uh, ceremony. And then we would like to invite you to a discussion with a panel um, of uh, different individuals from the conference board and the conference audience to kind of discuss a little bit where we may want to move this community to uh, in the future. So, and with this, I would say um, we um, come to the last um, award. Uh, this award was originally institutionalized as a so-called Best Workshop Award. And uh, over time, we have kind of uh, considered what we believe is the best workshop. What is the best workshop? You know, it's the best technique, you know, best engagement. Actually, we thought um, uh, the best workshop would be characterized by two things. First of all, the idea of the workshops at this conference is about bringing together sciences and companies. So bridging between science and uh, companies, bridging from uh, research into application. So that, that's, that's one, you know, strengthening uh, the ties of this, uh, this conference into industry. And second, um, we would thought that uh, doing that with, say, new innovative formats in terms of enriching the variety of things that we do at this conference, that would be a second uh, kind of characteristic that we would love to see at the best workshop. And this year, in that sense, as the most innovative contribution in terms of a workshop, strengthening our relation from the research into business is awarded to Thomas Holzmann and Stefan Neininger. From, um, and the two of you, uh, you've arranged to have uh, this very, very nice pitching event, which was the first time at this conference. We got a lot of positive feedbacks on that. Yes, 
This time I didn't spoil it. You noticed that maybe. Um, and um, please come up here on stage. We have two hearts. Unfortunately, because we couldn't uh, anticipate that it was two individuals that at the end that we would nominate the prize to, you have to hold this one award with two hands. Thanks very much. <laughs> Give a big hand of applause to the two guys. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. And um, yeah, then as I said, this, this was that. And uh, yeah, finally, before we go into the panel discussion, I would like to share this short video with you. I'm myself, I must say, kind of curious to see what it is. Um, what I asked the Maurice when we discussed about the conference and what the purpose of the filming was and so on, I said, you know, it's, it is a conference, but it is not really a professional service. It's more like it's a community of people that shares like beliefs and values and interests and behind the conference, as I said yesterday, are a lot of individuals with their individual enthusiasm. And so it's really more about sharing the energy. And that is what I asked him to do, try to catch the, the energy of the event. And Maurice, thanks very much for uh, keeping up so long and, uh, and uh, making that possible. And so this is what I would like to share with you. conference, in my opinion, is a great place to learn new insights from developments in industry, technology development, but also how innovation spread into markets, e.g. food platforms and so on. And for me, it's a fantastic event and I've learned many, many new things here. We invited great people uh, discussing uh, the topics in an adequate way. So I took away a, a lot of things, so specifically on entrepreneurship as well on what's relevant for the future of a company. I'm very thankful to the organizers, the University of Konstan, for making this uh, opportunity for me to be here in Germany. This is a very enjoyable and pleasurable event and I've learned a great deal. community for following our call and visit uh, Stuttgart in 2018 and I'm very much looking forward to the 21st anniversary edition that we're going to host next year at South of France at the Côte d'Azur. So thanks very much. Thanks very much for um, joining this year, and this is um, this year's ICE uh, conference edition. Um, uh, it was a great pleasure to host you here, and I would very much would like to see you again and uh, next year in France. And this is why uh, we would like to discuss a little bit where we want to move the community to. And of course, um, one of my panelists is the host of next year's conference. Mark, would you please join on stage? Okay, Mark Polo um, <laughs> will join in a minute, and then I would like to call in Iklak, who was volunteering to join for this panel too. And Iklak, ah, oh, Iklak is there. Is there. Yeah, yeah. This time at least. This time is there, and then is Roland, if you would like to join um, on stage, and Mark um, as the organizer of this year, please.
So um, I guess we just start, you know. Um, our French host of next year will join in a minute, I guess. I, I've just seen one running out and uh, trying to get him. Um, <laughs> if I just may say so, uh, Mark, you've seen the video now, having been uh, with me uh, in the honorable position to host the conference this year. Uh, what do you think about the event? This year's event. Uh, this year's I, event. <laughs> I, I, think, I think it was a great event from my side. So uh, also from my team, I think they, they did a great job. And uh, uh, I think um, uh, it also helped to, uh, to uh, in particular, the social events to, uh, to, uh, to create this community, to, uh, to, to build trust between us and to uh, then come into common projects. Um, I think that was great this year, the conference, as it was in the past, but also to this year. Okay. It's like you came over from Berkeley. Thanks very much for joining us. And uh, uh, you know, you go over. You have a round the world cricket. You're going to the you know Asia now. Yeah. What is what is kind of a, a, a takeaway that you uh, take from the discussions and impressions you, you got? The okay. So um, I definitely had a wonderful time. Um, I am indebted to both of you and all of you for organizing this event and for giving us this window into. Um, the local area and for us to, you know, then collaborate further and, you know, find ways of intersection. Um, in terms of, um, I'm not sure if this is exactly your question, like, I, I think you're just asking for takeaways, but maybe I can just um, go one step further and say, uh, where I'm, you know, in terms of, like, what I think the conference could be or what we could do going forward. Um, I'm trying to figure out what's really the composition of the audience here. And um, I think we've had a number of industry people present on the stages. We've had a lot of PhD students presenting uh, their papers in the various conference sessions, um, mostly in the audience. Um, I feel that it's the PhD students and those of us that are, you know, I'm going to say with our students or, you know, something like that. Um, I don't think that we have a lot of representation from the industry people in the audience itself. And so I'm, what I'm trying to figure out, and this, I'm not trying to figure out only for this event. I want to figure it out broadly because we have events at Berkeley. Um, we like. I, th I think this is this is just a question of how does academics and industry really connect? What what would it be like the uh, the best or the meaningful way? And and I don't know that it's fully possible. I don't know which is the the version that will work the best. But like the ideal in my mind would be that. Half the people in the audience are industry people and half the people are academics and that whatever is going on on the stage is somehow relevant to both and that the, there's some mixing going on. This may not be possible, um, but it might be possible with a segment, and I don't know what that segment is, which people in industry. Is it the CIO, uh, the, the you know innovation people in a company? Is it uh, the entrepreneurs that are kind of representing new uh, industry. Are they the ones that sh would be the segment? Um, I I'm, I'm getting to where is the common ground between this? Because I think, um, I think that is the step for uh, where nobody has really figured it out. I think that's the step for kind of the improvement overall. Uh, I feel like um, from the PhD student perspective, Watching the industry viewpoints on the stage is very healthy because you get out of your, you know, exact project and you kind of see how um, these other people are thinking about it. And of course, keeping in mind, you're going to have to work with them later anyway, so you might as well, you know, understand. Um, uh, but I'm not sure the other thing is happening yet. So mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying? I'm searching for the like ultimate of how industry would, would really connect with an academic event. 
And I feel like we're close. And I just, that's, that would be the ideal discussion or the ideal takeaway, the ideal improvement for next year or like all of those types of things. I'm, I'm looking for that. Okay. Mark, thanks for joining. <laughs> uh, do you have uh, any thoughts on, you know, uh, in particular this, this, this issue of, of, you know, how to even more foster that, that, that integration, that tapping in or that, that linking the science and, and, and business world together, kind of creating this um, a blended uh, community? I think it's an interesting question, but uh, I would say, uh, as usual, we try to do our best in inviting people from the industry, which is what you have done, uh, in, in nice perspective, I would say. Uh, but what is maybe uh, missing is a kind of a matchmaking. Matchmaking between what the researchers are doing and what the industry is looking for. And this is something we have in mind to do next year. Do a matchmaking. And not only, not only a matchmaking uh, with the uh, company in France, because next year it will be in France, but we try also to make a link with the industry, for example, in Germany, uh, but uh, also in other countries. And I think that might be the best opportunity with the uh, matchmaking that people know exactly in advance what they would find at the conference and what would make sense for them to why to come to, to the conference. But sometimes people come to the conference for a specific workshop or something else, and suddenly they discover another opportunity because they look at something and they, they realize, oh, it is interesting for me. So we, sometimes we get this kind of thing, feedback from people from the industry. So I think that's also uh, an interesting uh, aspect of making this kind of uh, link between industry mm -hmm. and uh, Roland, I saw you so smiling in between, so it kind of uh, seemed to resonate with thoughts you had. What would be your comment on that? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think uh, we have a spectrum. We can go fully academic, we can go fully industrial, but apparently we benefit from the combination. Mm -hmm. But then we should exploit that more in the format of the conference, and this is why it was obvious that uh, the pitching event was, uh, was recognized as a, as, a, as a contribution to that. What I, uh, what I would suggest as an idea is that I would like to have like a cafe model where, where you have the industrial side and the academic side and then you, uh, that, that either academics or industrial partners can raise an issue very shortly and then uh, academics can give a take on what they think of that. And then the industrial partners, they have like 10 or more opinions that they can collect and they're wise enough to, to pick out what they like and what they don't like. On the other hand, I would like to be posing a question to them about whether, uh, about my future directions of research, what, whether it fits their needs, whether it makes sense from their perspective. So in, in addition to the pitching event, you could have a cafe model, for example, to, to sort of more strengthen in the format mm -hmm. what you do. Okay. But that is on the, under the assumption that I think we should really benefit from the combination. Mm -hmm. Now, Mark, we had, this year we had this uh, pretty unique model. So, you know, research institute at a university, um, a professional organization kind of on the other end with a strong network uh, into the regional uh, ecosystem of industries. Um, I thought it was working out quite well. Uh, maybe also added to blending the two worlds together. What were your impressions? What were your, the feedbacks you got from your industry partners? So basically from the pure number um, on the registration list, we were certainly 30% not from academic, so from the participant number. But um, for sure it, the presentations were more, in at least in the last days or the first two days, were more on the academic side. Today we had more workshops. I think um, the acceptance was uh, quite high. In particular, in the pitching event, we had uh, many investors involved today. So I, I saw many people that I usually are uh, seeing in the um, investment community or investment pitching events that are more um, that are purely uh, non-academic. So I think I think uh, strengthening this perspective uh, in in the future would 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 uh, would uh, 
bring more uh, people also from this side into here the, into mm -hmm. the conference and also having a matchmaking not only with investors but also with industry corporate uh, innovation departments open innovation organizations of um, of, 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 of of companies could uh, could could uh, bring both sides together or mm -hmm. I, I don't see it as both <coughs> sides but it's uh, it's because uh, often you have also research in, uh, in in companies so that also participated here so due to this the community anyway is already mixed but it's uh, it's uh, so so you cannot really separate it but in, in, into these two sides although there are certainly more um, uh, a lot of people that have a university background but uh, there are also people in in in, in, in from from uh, from companies that uh, also published here some papers okay if we I mean uh, I can be we can certainly agree on exactly you know trying to strengthen this this blending of different perspectives and th that I, I think generally is a part of that interdisciplinary character of the conference as a whole uh, which uh, kind of uh, brings up you know question about topics you know as this is traditionally more an engineering community, or it, 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 it kind of uh, emerged from a, a more or less um, engineering background. Um, I've seen uh, um, you act like having <laughs> a lot of uh, presentations on, you know, AI, blockchain, and so on. So, like naturally, we, you know, may we, we feel those topics are relevant. Uh, we not necessarily maybe perceive them right now already as engineering topics. Um, what was your perspective, uh, 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 perception on the variety of themes um, and so on? I know that you, that you're a great fan of these data and AI topics. Uh, would you feel this is something that should, you know, blend into the program more than it was this time, or was it okay? Are there other topics that you've seen that you would you would uh, uh, see add to the content? Yeah. Okay. Um, so basically, reflection on topics, right? Um, I, I, my, kind of my own, first of all, like, like background on this is, first of all, I'm a technical person, right? I mean, like, I, I come from, from a technical background. And for 13 or 14 years, I've been at Berkeley, but I've, you know, and I'm in the College of Engineering, but what I've been doing is bringing mindset and broad skills and I'm, I'm kind of I've been bringing the non-engineering parts to the engineering school right so I've been doing that for some time and um, and the logic was well we have all these technical people and why don't we um, you know grow them in in this other dimension why don't we work on that so then we were doing that and then more recently we said all right now that we're doing that let's put some very relevant technical areas back in on top of that. So now we have people with the right behaviors, attitudes, the kind of speed of doing things, the perspective of, of uh, how things are, are built, grown from the beginning. And, you know, and then we started to add blockchain and data and AI and kind of like very implementation oriented almost, um, very applied versions and so we you know on top of the broad skills we're going back in the technical thing ultimately you're always going to have these two tracks you're going to have the broad track and you're going to have the deep track and um and i don't know that like i don't think you can you should get rid of one or the other i um you know i find i'm like always surprised in a way that like while I love the deep tracks, you know I love the AI blockchain. Like I like those topics, but when I look at how big is the audience for the broad conversation versus the the narrow conversation, the broad conversation has a full room in it, and the narrow conversation has twenty people instead of you know one hundred and fifty people, right? So, it, you know. Everything always tells us, oh, we should go deep. We should talk about this technical area. And then, you know, and then you look at the audience and the audience comes for the other one. So I, I'm not sure I have a good sense of what's really right, but I think you really need both. I, I think it wouldn't be right if you couldn't somehow intersect them.
Okay, that's that's. I, I guess that's the balance of the the Michael Jordan of statistics you had on your slide yeah. and the Michael Jordan of ba basketball, right? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right. So if we had Michael Jordan of basketball here, we'd have a really full room. And if we had Michael Jordan of statistics, we have we'll have a full room, but it'll it, it's a different kind of full room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mark, in that sense, if you look at Envision next year's conference, is there any topic that you have in mind already that you would say that is, that is truly something that you would uh, want to put into focus, that is something that you would like to, to, to really take care and make a focus topic of the conference next year? Yes, sure, because we want to please our president, Emmanuel Macron. We would like to get the parrainage of the uh, president because it's opening many doors. And uh, in that case, we are looking towards uh, empathic and cognitive uh, systems mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I think it's uh, an opportunity. Innovation is often at the uh, crossroad of different disciplines. Mm -hmm. And uh, the good point of this conference is that we have different disciplines there. Mm -hmm. uh, design, engineering, technology, innovation. And uh, anyone coming from one of those domains could learn from the other domains. Mm -hmm. And there are plenty of opportunities to make innovation based on this kind of inter interdisciplinary approach. So yes, I, I think in terms of um, focus about the uh, headline of the conference, which is about uh, immersive, also immersive technologies. Mm -hmm. I think uh, all those uh, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, and so on, is also a nice perspective that could be combined with the uh, empathic and cognitive systems. Okay. So I think there are plenty of opportunities there to, to develop some uh, innovative stuff. That sounds really great. Roland, have, do you have any thoughts on this topic? Yeah, um, yeah I, I do have. I, I think, so suppose, from my perspective, if you would lead a research team, you have uh, two options and something in between, but two options, either you have a cross or interdisciplinary team, then you focus on one topic and you benefit from the cross-disciplinarity because you look at the same thing and you go discuss the same thing from different perspectives, or you have one discipline in common and you apply it in many different ways and you also benefit, but if you just do both, mm -hmm. then you go everywhere and then you, go, you don't go anywhere in the end. So, but you have hybrid versions where, for example, you can say, um, okay, we have a conference with an overall topic and then let's say three main subtopics which are mini conferences hosted by that same well, mm -hmm. thing and then all of a sudden you can still have, um, um, it's not like it's now too broad, that's my okay. opinion um, in a way. Okay. So we seem, to for we, we seem to have forgotten how to benefit from the fact that MOT was multidisciplinary from the beginning. And that's a brilliant idea, and we, we shouldn't spoil that. Okay. Thanks very much for that comment. And I, I would just want to take the opportunity to open to the audience if there's any question about next year's conference, or if there's also a remark where you think we, uh, where you feel that uh, there's uh, a need to further develop either topics or the formats of the conference. <clears throat> There's a comment up there. Um, um, in terms of the formats of these conferences, I, I don't know if it's been tried, but you know we have the academics on the one side of the argument and the industrialists on the other. Could we have, say, for example, the three days? Day one very much focused on the sort of academic work. Day two is the mix, and day three is industrial. Because that way you'll get the right people, someone will fit in in the right place. Um, and certainly for industrialists, they can't spare three days. There's no way they can come out to companies and, and, and participate. And, and of course on day three, there really has to be some results and tangible outputs for, for the industrialists. But certainly day one, you know, to be quite clear on the topic areas. So you don't have to have such a broad spectrum, but certainly focus uh, on some of those aspects. And I think maybe, uh, and, and I would expect day two to be the most popular day because it, hopefully that's where people want to sort of hear both sides of the, the, the story. 
comments. Thanks very much for um, this uh, remark and the comment. Thanks very much. I really appreciate that. Any other comment or remark or question? Then, uh, ah, yeah, there's James. Yes, well, first of all, thank you for a really th thought-inspiring and provocative conference in many respects. The observation I wanted to make was that I think the value of interdisciplinarity is absolutely key. Innovation is intrinsically finding new things at the margins of existing things, so interdisciplinarity is necessary. I'd like to see it pushed further, though. Um, I know I've been involved in innovation and technology development management for many years, but from a slightly different community. And I wonder if I'd like to see uh, more interaction between those communities. And those communities are essentially an engineering and management community on the one hand, and a social science and economics community on the other. And I think that both, from my observations, both communities have got valuable things to say to one another. Mm -hmm. And if we are really to understand and make the most of technology and innovation, I think we need to grasp that nettle of getting those very different communities together. Thanks very much, James, for, for your comment and for inspiration. So, uh, well, what could I say? Thanks very much to our panelists. Before you rush off, the clock. Um, we, there is there is a minor there is a there is a there is a minor prize, a minor final one. This is most presentation on a single day. You get that one. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks very much to yeah. uh, the panelists. Um, we still have a little bit um, of um, a prize going on with the pitching event. Uh, we will leave the stage and hand it over to Mark. Before um, you kick us off the stage okay. here, um, can, and I, you know, we were we were giving kind of a little bit of like critical thinking about how to improve for next year, but I don't want to leave without saying that um, it was really a wonderful experience and that I'm well aware of how much work goes into pulling this together and how many connections you've brought from all over the world as well as all over this region and not everybody can do even this level or even close to this level. So you guys really deserve a huge um, applause or a huge, you know, congratulations for what you actually did achieve. Um, you know, just because we can think of a way to improve something doesn't mean we don't recognize how good a job you did already. Thanks so much. Thank you. That's very kind. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. And um, yeah, before I hand over to uh, Mark, I, I would just say. This was the last plenary that I have uh, the honor to share with you. You have been a great audience. Thanks very much for uh, you know, uh, accepting me for the last three days. And uh, I would say for this year's goodbye and love to see you back in France next year. Thank you. So, thank you, Guido. Uh, the plenary is basically not over. So, because we have one of the important, most important parts uh, for this year's conference. I introduced it in the beginning that we have this um, new format, the pitching event that also was awarded by the board, not from my side, but it was a decision by the entire board of the ICE conference to award this uh, new format. And uh, for that, I want to ask um, uh, Thomas uh, on the stage and uh, Stefan and Hans-Georg to um, uh, give us uh, maybe a brief um, overview on, on the format and also um, then to award the winners of the pitching event. Um, Stefan, do you like to, to give us uh, maybe a brief overview also on Bansbach that is supporting this, uh, this new format and, uh, and what you are doing at Bansbach and why you are interested in a tech community and uh, startups in a tech community? That would be interesting to get some insights on that from your side. Me? Is, um, does it work? One, two. Oh, okay. Well, thanks for having me, having us, uh, at least 
uh, one non-academic speech here. Um, <laughs> uh, well, yes, um, uh, as you already said, I would like to start with a short introduction um, of Bansbach, what we are doing. You find our logo over there, Bansbach, the entire spectrum. Uh, what does it mean? What are we doing? Um, well, Bansbach is well known for tax business and consulting uh, services, as well as a auditing um, uh, auditing company. Established already in 1924, um, we have a record over decades to service our clients uh, clients um, in the entire spectrum regarding conducting uh, business and uh, serve them with um, well different uh, solutions. Um, we have eight offices in Germany at the, at the moment, um, actually one new in, in Frankfurt, and we are active member of Creston. Creston is an uh, international network of independent accounting firms, uh, which enable us to, um, well, um, but to accompany our clients, especially young entrepreneurs, startups, if they conduct business globally and they go abroad, um, we can uh, follow up and uh, help them to do that. Not a big question, why do we have such a pitching event here today? Why we as Bansbach has a startup desk in general? What are we doing and why do we do that? Um, I mean, we focus on entrepreneurs and we support this field through uh, lots of different activities, um, which aims to build up a solid and surround ecosystem, especially here in Germany and uh, here in Baden-Württemberg. Um, but uh, the question is, why are we doing this? I'm convinced that we face an eruption. Well, don't get me wrong, I really mean it's an eruption um, that has already started and yet many people ignore that. We have to be aware, especially it's talking, talking uh, for, for Germany, that uh, the most, our most important industry is changing. I mean, the automotive um, industry, um, Germany is well known for the automotive industry, and this is an industry which is changing. Um, you already know, for example, future car will have different technologies. One example, um, cars will be built by less parts and pieces, of course. Um, think about diesel engine. Today, I'm not an engineer, but I think you need more than 1,000 parts um, with, which uh, need to be uh, engineered, produced, supplied. This is a whole business, and this is what Germany is built around. Um, but again, this sector is already changing. Um, the technology is different in the next generation. Talking about electrified cars, for example, Germany is not really the hotspot for the new technologies. Um, to give you one example, safety solutions um, in terms of secure autonomous driving, for, except, uh, for example, is located in Israel. So the companies buy that uh, kind of service and instead of support um, startups and um, support um, and contribute to build up an ecosystem where startups um, with the ideas, which the, the days, today, Monday, uh, Tuesday, we have a lot of ideas here. Um, but if we, um, if we are not cautious enough, if we, see, if we do not build that ecosystem, um, those people are eager to go abroad uh, to hotspots like um, Berlin or um, to go to, to the valley. Um, where they can have the support um, and, and uh, find the solution to really build up their business. And if you agree with me um, that large parts of our technology today um, and industries are built on, sorry, uh, industries um, are built on technology which face more and more hurdles and obstacles in the, in the future, then you already understand why we as Bansbach engage us uh, in terms of startups and built a startup desk um, for two, uh, uh, two years ago. I already mentioned in a globalized world, um, we have to ensure that people with great business ideas, um, that, they, that Germany is attractive for them, Baden-Württemberg is attractive, and if uh, the idea is born here, um, then we should do everything that the people have the right ecosystem to stay here and uh, to found their business here. And for us, those are the customers and our clients of tomorrow. Well, that requires that we understand the special needs for such entrepreneurs. And all together here, um, we met in the, in these days, we can contribute, we really can contribute to build such an ecosystem which enables 
startups, uh, smart ideas, people um, who have courage to start the business with maximum support here in Germany and uh, moreover here in Baden-Württemberg. Now I just want to give you a short introduction how we do that. How do we work with our um, startup desk in Bansbach? We offer not just business coachings, um, for example, in uh, accelerator programs, but um, much more important, we support um, startups um, in almost every aspect of founding a business. And we really accompany them when they, when they do the first steps and um, they can drop every question to us. And we try to help them with our network, with our experts. And um, this um, is really a different and distinguished idea. Why is it distinguished, our service? Because of our people, of our team. Our, um, we're really proud to have um, people in our startup uh, desk team which has not just an academic background um, and a profession in, let's say, a tax profession or audit profession. Moreover, we have uh, people in, <clears throat> in, in our startup desk team uh, especially coming from, or for example, coming from a banking background. Um, me, in my case, I was a chief financial officer um, before um, I started at uh, Bansbach. So, and we, and my colleagues, we know uh, what does it take and what does it need to build up um, a startup. And uh, we can offer, um, well, network, and stuff like that, and this is the way we want to do business. This is the way we understand we have to change our business model as well in a changing world, as I said before, and uh, to serve our future clients. Well, um, today, um, generally, now I talked a lot about supporting startups, and support startup, that means to give people, to give companies, and to give um, ideas a platform, which is the reason why we are today. And uh, maybe you'd like to um, say something about the startup pitching event, um, uh, which was, by the way, a great event. And, and thank you um, uh, for having us here. And it was really a great organized. Um, and uh, we will uh, have the chance to, to get known a couple of uh, the startup pitch today um, during the uh, ceremony now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Stefan. And also thank you for, for having you in the, and also Mark for this great um, event for the workshop we had today because it was I mean, ICE conference, we are talking about innovation. Today we lived innovation because this was a new new event format. And um, we talked a lot about startups today. Uh, I will translate it now a little bit also then in the academic world because then it's called technology transfer. And that was actually the basic idea behind this startup pitching event because um, for the future, it, that's my, my vision actually and also my desire because a lot of very good research results are produced in this community. A lot of new ideas and when I think when we talk today about matchmaking and matchmaking, the idea was born like Mark and, and I, we did a workshop four years ago in an experiment with a software which we will enhance next year. It was born here at this conference in this community and uh, the idea is that for the next year and the year after that maybe more academic papers which have a practical impact should also pitch in this event to show their results because in terms of technology transfer we need to transfer these academic results to the market and that's where actually I'm coming from, AIM Ventures. We are investing in 70% directly of spin -off, in spin-offs from university. PhD students, professors, who have developed something new in the field of 3D printing, industrial 3D printing, and that's what I think it's matchmaking about, to understand both worlds and to bring them together, and that's the core of ICE. And I hope with this format we could kick off a new initiatives for the future. And uh, today we also have winners, startup winners, and we had also one guy, one brave guy from Estonia who transferred his paper into a startup pitch. We will see that later. And this deserves an extra applause because that is the pioneer for the startup 
pitching and also academic pitching event, hopefully also for the future. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, um, Thomas. Uh, and then I don't want to lose more time. Um, and we now uh, come to the first award. And um, we have split it in categories, actually. So it's like the Oscars here. Um, well, the first category we, we talk about is life science. And um, well, I'm very happy to welcome Rebis on the stage. Please give a warm applause. Alok Singh. Um, well, it was uh, really an impressive. Uh, wait, wait a second. Wait, wait a second. <laughs> um, it was really an, an um, well impressive um, uh, pitch you, you had to stay. And I'd like to give you a chance to just share the audience uh, for, let's say, two minutes, um, what you pitched today and uh, what is your idea about. Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, so rabies is about bacteria. I'm always scared of them. So uh, I guess two years ago, uh, it, it was a normal event that we had an institute event and we realized that the food which we brought there was lying for a long time and it was bad before the event started. And we got this thing from there, okay, they, we need something which could measure how is the food before we eat it. And now, two years later, uh, we are in a stage where we have the prototype which is working and we are trying different kind of food stuff to measure the quality of the food in terms of bacteria. We count the number of bacteria in your food and we predict how good is the food and when is it going to be bad. Um, surprisingly, it's an optical technology which is not very usual in life sciences in terms of counting bacteria. Usually, there are multiple techniques where you grow the bacteria on, on, a, on a plate, we count, and we call it plate counting. You count the number of bacteria like that. But we came up with something very innovative, uh, which helps you to just scan the food and tell the number of bacteria. And I'm proud that I have been able to present it here. The audience has been amazing downstairs when we pitched the event. The event was very, very enthusiastic. A lot of startups with wonderful ideas and some wonderful way of pitching today I watched. So it was a wonderful event and thanks a lot for the award. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thanks again. Well, having the schedule in mind, we just follow up and come right to the next category, which is IoT and manufacturing. And I'd like uh, to welcome Fluman on the stage. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So you have 30 seconds to, <laughs> to tell something about uh, your idea. Uh, Five seconds, we built digital twins. If you're interested in digital twins for your uh, industry sector, please visit us in Constance. It's nice, like, it's a very beautiful place. Okay. Or in the internet, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we have uh, one more category award, which is um, for mobility. And... Uh, Please welcome EMHS GmbH. Thomas Müller.
This one here? Yes. Again, 30, 30 minutes? Uh, 30, 30 minutes, 30 seconds. seconds. Sorry. Uh, he has high temperature you already. The bus. <laughs> the buses are leaving. Hello. Yes, hello. Um, thank you for this nice award. We are working in the Intra Logistics 4.0 business, where we are on the way to develop an EFLE, which means an autonomous driving warehouse unit in Germany, uh, autonom fahrende Lagereinheit. Thank you. So, and now um, we already mentioned that we have a last award, with, which is really a special award, um, because uh, we had one person who handed in an academic paper and participated the last days here already, and he committed himself to turn this paper into a pitch deck. Um, what we like to recognize as best academic pitch deck of today, please welcome Heiki Lil from Estonia. Uh, first, thank you all. Uh, second one, the idea was uh, to save energy from uh, wind microgenerators generators and um, I believe that can be done <laughs> and if I note before that I ended up here I would also put my suit on <laughs> thank you very much Perfect. thanks again for having us so, thank you Mark thank you